I want to show you a couple of photos. So this first photo here is my first ever deep space astrophoto. Now compare that photo to one of my most recent deep space astrophotos. Now you might be thinking, well, of course the newer ones are better. You've upgraded your equipment over time. It's more expensive. It's better. Let me stop you right there. The equipment that took the photo of Andromeda was actually two times more expensive than the equipment that took my most recent deep space astro image. So if it's not the equipment, then what is the difference? First of all, who am I and why should you listen to me? My name's Ian, I'm an astrophotographer, and I've been involved with telescopes for over a decade. If I could go back in time and give myself some advice when I was first starting out, there are a number of things I would tell myself. So I've broken this down into three different sections, and the first one I want to talk about is all about gear. When I was in the telescope industry, we would tell people the three most important pieces of equipment that you can buy when starting your journey in deep space astro. Number one is your mount the tracker or the EQ mount, the thing that follows the stars as they move across the night sky. That is number one, the mount. Now number two is going to be the mount. And so you could probably assume what number three is, the mount. Wah, wah, wah. The reason we emphasize the mount is because it is your most important piece of equipment you can have for photographing deep space. You can have the most expensive camera on the market with a 100 megapixel sensor. You can have the most expensive glass you could find that could be ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. But if you can't track the stars properly, you're gonna get a crappy image no matter what. So if you want to get into Deep Space Astro and you're trying to figure out where to invest your money, the best place you can do that is your tracking mount. Because you can always upgrade your telescope, you can always change your camera out, but if you have a nice solid tracking mount, you can use that for a very, very long time. When you look for tracking mounts, you'll see a section on the technical specs which says weight capacity. Now, a lot of the times this weight capacity is rated for using a visual telescope. If you talk to any seasoned veteran astrophotographer, they'll tell you that that stated weight capacity is not the actual maximum load that the mount can handle. They'll recommend that you put either half to two thirds of the weight capacity on the mount. Any more than that, and it'll start to hinder the performance of the mount. It'll hinder the tracking capability of the mount. The next thing I wanna talk about is cameras. My advice to you is if you have a DSLR camera already, start with that. You don't need to upgrade to a dedicated astronomy camera right away. It's always best to start with the equipment you already have. Let's talk about the next piece of advice that I would give people, and that's to start small and start simple. Look, I've seen it happen so many times where people get a system that's either way too big for them and way too much, or they get too many pieces, too many components at once, and it becomes overwhelming, it becomes complicated, and they get frustrated, and it takes them a long time to get their first image. Versus if you start with a simple setup, you're out there taking photos, getting better each and every time a lot faster. What you should do is master the basics first and then look at things that you can upgrade down the road. So master the things like polar alignment, finding objects, learning software or learning how to use your mount, learning what exposure times or settings are good for deep space astrophotography. Then you can introduce other components. Maybe you realize that you're having trouble with focus, so then you get the automatic focuser. Or maybe you realize that you have trouble with longer exposures at five to 10 minutes, so then you get an automatic guider to help you do those longer exposures. When you master the basics and then upgrade components one at a time, it allows you to be really good at troubleshooting when things go wrong, you can identify where problems are, fix them really quickly, and then continue your imaging. Versus if you have all of these different pieces of equipment, it becomes overwhelming. And if something goes wrong, you don't know how to diagnose the problem because you're not familiar with each individual piece yet. When we talk about a simple setup, the optics should be simple as well. So either use a long focal length lens that you already have, or use a wide field telescope. Now, if you're looking at a lens versus a telescope, I'll go back to what I've been saying before, which is use what you already have. So if you already have a long focal length lens, like a 200 or 400 or anything like that, start with that. Now, if you're looking to upgrade to a telescope, that's a great option too, because telescopes in the long run are gonna have advantages over lenses because they have accessories specifically made to help you get better photos for Deep Space Astro and just make things easier for you when you're doing Deep Space Astro. Now look, I've used all sorts of telescope types, refractors, reflectors, Newtonians, 
SCTs, RCs, CDKs, IPAs, ABCs. I've used almost all of them. And I can tell you that the best place to start when learning Deep Space Astro is a wide field refractor. When it comes to the design of the refractor, you wanna look for ones that are Apo triplets or are Petsful designs, anything that's made for astrophotography. And look, there are all different manufacturers who make different types of imaging refractors and they're all great. But the main thing to focus on is to start with a wide field one between 50 and 80 millimeters. That's a good place to start before you go down getting longer focal lengths. Now that we've talked about gear, let me give you some advice about when you're out in the field actually doing astrophotography. And the first one is all about sky quality. You want those dark skies. You need those dark skies. The darker the skies, the better quality images you're gonna get. A bright light polluted sky is going to introduce a lot of noise into your images versus if you are out, let's say in a national park where it's really, really dark, you'll have less noise from sky brightness, giving you cleaner images, cleaner data to work with, which will give you better results in the long run. Now, I don't wanna to get too technical about image quality and signal to noise ratio and things like that. There are tons of videos and resources out there to help you understand that if you're more technically minded and want to learn about that stuff. But the good advice that I can give you is the darker the sky, the better your image quality is going to be. What you wanna look at is the Bortle reading of the location that you're shooting from. And if you don't know what the Bortle scale is, it's just a scale for telling you how dark your skies are. And if you don't know how to find dark skies, I made a video about it and I'll link it in the description below so you can check it out. But really quickly, just to give you a quick example of what it's like shooting from dark skies versus shooting from light polluted skies, 120 exposures from a light polluted area is the same as taking 12 exposures from a darker area, like in a Bortle 3. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about where to go to shoot Deep Space Astro. The next tip I would give you is something that I definitely wish I heard when I first started, and that's to plan your targets that you wanna shoot before you go out and shoot them. This is advice I wish I heard when I was first starting. I would drive out an hour to an hour and a half to get to a relatively dark sky spot. I would set up and then I would figure out when I wanted to shoot after I set up. For example, I'd look and see on my phone app, oh look, I could shoot the black eye galaxy, it's up tonight. Just to realize that one, it was really, really low in the horizon, so it was really, really muddy and not sharp, and two, it was tiny in my field of view when I was using my 130 refractor. So planning ahead would prevent me from trying to go after a target and get ready for a target that wasn't even gonna look good. And then I would spend the rest of the night just trying to figure out what else I could shoot bouncing around targets. So if you plan ahead and know what you're shooting, that will ensure that you're not wasting any time because the more time you can get on target, the better the detail and the better your image results are gonna be. So to do that, make sure you have a plan. You wanna shoot the Rosette Nebula? Well, how does it look like in your field of view with the equipment you're using? How high will it be up in the sky? Where in the sky will it be? Are there gonna be trees or mountains blocking it? How long can you shoot for? Use online resources like telescopius.com or astronomy.tools to help you plan and figure out what's gonna be a good target for you to shoot when you go out and do Deep Space Astro. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about is about exposure time. Now there's no such thing as the perfect exposure time but there is such thing as the wrong exposure time. Theoretically, you can calculate every little thing to give you the optimal signal to noise ratio, but you're gonna have to know a lot of different things about the environment that you're shooting from. And let's be honest, you don't really need to know all of that information to take really good photos. Determining a good exposure time really depends on a number of things like how bright is the sky? What's the level of light pollution that you're in? How good is your tracking? Like how long exposures can you do before you start to see star trails? Are you using a DSLR or are you using a cooled astro camera? And how bright is the target that you're going after? A good rule of thumb is to try to get up to a two minute exposure. Now, if you can't do that, let's say you can only do a minute or a minute and 30 seconds, that's fine too. Just do what you can with the equipment you've got available. My recommendation is anywhere between the two and 10 minute exposure time. If you can't get up to two minutes, that's okay. Just do as long as you can. Another piece of advice that I wish I knew about when I first started was to stick to a single target. You see, when I first started out, I really just wanted to shoot as many targets as possible as quickly as possible. So I'd take a five minute exposure of some galaxy and then move over to some nebula and take 10 exposures of that. And then I'd move to another 
part of the sky and take 15 exposures of that. And I would just bounce around the sky taking pictures of all these different things. And the downside to that is to get good images, you need lots of exposure time. You need that good signal to noise ratio. If you just wanna explore like what I was doing, bouncing around to different targets and seeing what was out there, then I would recommend getting a smart telescope like a Seastar or a Vespera because those are really good at doing that. They excel at showing you different targets and it's really simple. You don't have to go through the complications of getting the deep space astro set up. But I would highly advise against doing what I did, bounce around targets and just get a couple exposures of each one. My recommendation would be to pick a target and stick to that target for as long as possible before it goes behind a tree or goes below the horizon or goes too low in elevation. This way you get tons of exposures, which means you'll get more detail cleaner images, higher quality images. And if your target sets earlier in the night, then pick two targets. Do the one that sets earlier in the night and then the one that's gonna be up later in the night. But don't bounce around tons of different targets. Avoid that if you can, especially if you have to drive out to locations. The more images you take of your target, the better detail you'll be able to pull out during processing. You'll be able to see all those finer little details than you would if you only took a few photos. That's that signal to noise that we're talking about where you'll be able to see the different defining features if you take more photos versus if you took less. All right, let's move on to the next piece of advice I would give. And that is to make sure that you take calibration frames, your biases, your darks, and your flat field frames. There are two key components when it comes to getting good astrophotos. It's a good signal to noise ratio, which is good data coming in, and it's calibration frames. Calibration frames are super important because it ensures that you have a nice flat image without vignetting. It helps remove dust spots if there's any on your camera or your telescope. And it gives you a huge reduction in noise. And all of that equates to a nice clean image. Your camera has a base level readout noise which can be removed using bias frames. Taking dark frames will remove thermal noise that's built up on your sensor when you take long exposures. And flat frames remove optical imperfections such as vignetting or dust motes on your telescope or camera. So if you have really good data from a night of imaging, but you didn't do calibration frames, you're still gonna be battling things like vignetting or dust spots, and you're still gonna have a lot of noise that's inherent in your images that you will have a really hard time getting rid of. But if you did apply those calibration frames, you're gonna have a clean image to start out with when you're post-processing. So it'll make it easier to pull out details and push the image further to get those finer, nice details without introducing a lot of noise and a lot of artifacts. All right, this next tip comes from all of the troubles that I had while starting astrophotography and dealing with all the different types of astro imaging systems that I've put together over the years. Things will not always work. And that's okay. It's going to happen. It's not an if, but a when. You have lots of things working together to help you do astrophotography. You have all different types of cables. You have electronics. You have hardware. You've got different types of software. And things just go wrong. It happens all the time. It happens to the best of us, all the way from beginner astrophotographers to professional observatories. We're no stranger to it, but keep in mind it happens and don't get frustrated when it happens. This is why it's really important to master each step of the astro process as you move forward in your astro journey. Because when you have those nights where things aren't working and everything's going wrong, you know how to diagnose the problem step by step. You can figure out where the problem is and you can figure out how to solve it so you can quickly get back to imaging and collecting data versus spending all night on forums trying to figure out what the problem is and by the end of it, you've wasted an entire clear night. Great, so we talked about the gear, we've talked about being in the field. Now I wanna give you some tips about bringing your images to life, which we call processing. Someone once said, if you are learning a new cooking recipe to follow the recipe down to the T as exact as possible, then once you've done it once or twice, or you have the confidence to do it on your own easily, you can start to experiment and add new things, add your own flair to it, then it becomes your own unique process. A lot of astro processing is just that, it's a process. My advice, follow a tutorial you like as exact as possible. Then once you feel comfortable with the tools to create astro images, begin to experiment and create your own unique style. 
One thing I see too much of in astrophotography is people trying really hard to stick to the right way to process. But at the end of the day, no one should stop you from creating the images you want to make. No one can tell you what your purpose is for making astrophotos. Only you can. Want to create fantasy dreamlike images like Derek Culver? Go for it. Want to experiment with different color combinations using real astronomical data like Galactic Hunter did? Make it happen. Want to be as scientifically accurate as possible? Have at it. For me, I like to walk the fine line between real and creative. And it's because I want to inspire people to start talking about astronomy, start talking about the night sky, and get them looking up more. So don't be afraid to push the boundary. Don't be afraid to take creative risks. All that I ask is that you're honest with your process. Well, that's it. I hope that helps. And any of you Astro veterans who are watching this video, if you could leave some comments down below of advice you'd give new astrophotographers, go for it. We need to help as many people get into astrophotography as possible, sharing the awesomeness of this hobby so we can get more people looking up. Anyways, I'll see y'all next time. Clear skies. Peace.